Axel Berger and uh, I'm working as a patent attorney in the same law firm as Stefan Steinbrenner at Badele Parkenberg, also in the Munich office. As to my technical background, I'm a biologist and uh, almost consequently uh, my focus of my daily work is uh, in life sciences, pharmaceuticals, biochemistry, this area. And today um, I want to give you a presentation about so-called supplementary protection certificates that are available in Europe for pharmaceutical products as well as for plant protection products. This is the brief agenda of what I want to address um, in this presentation. I want to give a, an introduction as to what SPCs, as they are generally abbreviated, um, are. Um, going through, as you can see, what is an SPC, how can it be obtained, and what uh, is its duration, while at the same time, for those that are already familiar with an SPC, or SPCs in general, um, I'm going to include the latest updates regarding um, jurisprudence in this highly dynamic field. And I'm going to finish with some particularities regarding infringement proceedings that are based on SPCs. So first, what is an SPC? And here it is to be noted that an SPC is a protective right on its own. So it's not a pure extension of a patent, uh, although it confers uh, an extension of protection to a particular product by a maximum of five and a half years. And I put a little asterisk here, I am going to come to this later. Products in this context, context are um, active ingredients, namely in medicinal products or in plant protection products. And the purpose of the creation of the tool supplementary protection certificate um, was and is to compensate developers that need to go extensive testing prior to putting the product on the market and to, such, to thus offer an incentive for continuing research in this. Um, context. The legal basis, I don't know if you can see this from, I put it uh, on purpose very small so that you don't try to uh, take this as a very important um, message here, but it's European regulations, um, which means that the last instance to have the final interpretation on the regulation is uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union who has been quite busy and still is with interpreting uh, these regulations. And finally, as an SPC is similar to the tool of uh, the patent term extensions as they are, for example, known in the US and Japan and also in Australia. So now, first of all, how can I obtain an SPC? and this is stipulated in Article 3 of the two regulations. Namely, a certificate shall be granted if, one, the product is protected by a basic patent and force, two, if I have obtained a valid authorization for that product, three, if the product has not already been subject to a certificate, and four, this authorization referred to above under B is the first authorization to place the product on the market. And now only just with these granting requirements, there has been a lot of uh, discussions and I'm going to the individual requirements now one after one. So first, what is not clear about the sentence, the product is protected by the, by the basic patent and force. And first, it's the definition or the interpretation of the term product. Here, there's well, there was the question whether an adjuvant, which is an ingredient which has on its own no therapeutic effect but enhances the effect of another agent, um, could be considered an active ingredient and therefore, according to the regulation, a product or not. And if this is not the case, whether a combination of an adjuvant together with an active ingredient could be a combination of active ingredients, which is again considered a product according to the regulation. And here the Court of Justice of the European U Union decided two months ago that no adjuvants 
are not considered active ingredients, and thus no SPC can be granted on the basis of natulant. Now coming to the plant side, also here it's not clear whether a safener, which is a substance that reduces the effect of an herbicide on the crop plant, could be considered a product according to the plant SPC regulation. And this decision is still pending before the CJEU. Same requirement, but here what is to be understood by the word protected. And here briefly the background, there arose some uncertainty from decisions delivered in November 2011 that altogether required that the product would need to be identified in the wording of the claims. So this was absolutely new and people did not quite understand where this um, reference to the wording of the claims came from. And it was unclear whether an indeed mentioning, a structural mentioning of the substance uh, was from now on to be required or not. So now, last month, the CJEU gave some guidance on the interpretation of how identified in the wordings of the claims should be understood. And he, he clarified that a functional definition of the product is in general sufficient as long as it is, and this is now a quotation, as long as the claims relate implicitly but necessarily and specifically to the active ingredient in question. As you see, this is still open to discussion what this actually means. It's still a pretty vague uh, description. However, the CJU concludes that the final interpretation of this guidance is up to the national authorities, respectively courts. Coming to the next requirement, it is the valid authorization. And here was also some unclarity um, regarding plant protection certificates, namely where it uh, is already established case law, established since 2010, that interim marketing authorizations, which are only valid for a maximum of three years, are considered authorizations with respect to the SPC regulation, and thus an SPC can be granted for them. Now the question was whether so-called emergency marketing authorizations, which are only valid for a maximum of 120 days, could also be considered valid authorizations or not. And here, um, the CJU decided in October 2013 that no, that such short-term authorizations are not valid authorizations under the plant protection regulation. Next requirement, which is a lot of dis has a lot of discussion, is the product has not already been the subject of an SPC, of a certificate, yeah, SPC. Here, it has been established case law um, that, I put a quotation here from Yisum, that a product cannot include the therapeutic use of an active ingredient protected by a basic patent. So once uh, an SPC had been granted for a specific product, this was the end of the story, no further medical uses, nothing. However, since summer 2012 in Urim, the CJU mentioned the following, this time even in the head note, the mere existence of an earlier marketing authorization obtained for veterinary medicinal products does not preclude the grant of a supplementary protection certificate for different application of the same product. So, so far current practice of the national patent offices is that the head note is interpreted quite narrowly, meaning that it's at the moment only applied to second medical use patents or respectively SPC applications. Under the same requirement, there was the question whether more than one SPC can be granted per basic patent. And here I quote where this uncertainty uh, originated from. This is a very old decision um, from 96, I think it was, which once said somewhere in the middle, you see paragraph 28, 
Under Article 3C of the regulation, only one certificate may be granted for each basic patent. However, the patent offices granted, nevertheless, several SPCs if several products were actually described in the basic patent as such. However, now in this famous Mediva decision, which is one of the three already mentioned 2000, November 2011 CJU decisions, this paragraph has actually been recited by the CJEU. And so now it was not clear whether this should be brought up once again and um, the CJEU really intended that only one certificate should be granted. Again, it was only somewhere in the middle of a decision, not part of a head note. So this has been the basis of another referral and the CJAU decided recently in a distinguishing manner, namely that in general, more than one SPC can be granted on the basis of the same patent. That however, in a case in which the early SPC has been to a single active ingredient and conferred protection over the use of that ingredient either alone or in combination. The patent holder is precluded from obtaining another SPC on the basis of the same patent for that active ingredient in conjunction with another active ingredient. Two decisions from last month. So what this actually means, um, I try to illustrate this here with a, a very simple equation. If you um, have an SPC that was con uh, granted to A, which confers protection not only to A, but also to A plus B, A plus C, A plus D, and so on. You are precluded from obtaining another SPC for any of the combinations, because this would uh, lead to some kind of evergreening of SPC protection. However, if your early SPC was to a combination which did not confer protection to A, A plus C, and so on, you're not precluding from having an additional SPCs granted for those combinations. Coming to the duration uh, of an SPC, here's a hands oil can calculation. You calculate the period from the filing of the patent application to the grant of the first marketing authorization in the community. What community means, I'll come to this in a second. You subtract five years from that period and if the resulting term is larger than five years, it is nevertheless limited to five years. And this is not 100% correct. Actually, it is five and a half years, and the reason is Article 36 of uh, a regulation directed at medicinal products for pediatric use. I briefly touched on that, which gives you an additional extension of the SPC by half a year if clinical trials are conducted in, in accordance with an agreed pediatric investigation plan. So this should provide an incentive to actually conduct such um, studies. I will skip this. So now coming to the grant of the first marketing authorization in the community. This has also been um, under heavy debate. The reason is that we are talking about European regulations and they do not only apply to the European Union but to the European economic market. And the consequence of this is that a marketing authorization in Switzerland counts as the first authorization. How can this be? Switzerland is neither, neither a member of the European Union nor of the European economic area. However, authorizations are automatically and still are somewhat automatically recognized in Liechtenstein and Liechtenstein is part of the European economic area. So now there was the, uh, the question whether also a Swiss marketing authorization which is recognized by Liechtenstein but which is not uh, granted in accordance with the directive indicated uh, in Article 3B of the SPC regulations, um, a valid first authorization in the community. And here, the CJEU um, ruled in or two months ago that yes, such also such an uh, authorization um, is considered the first authorization if it predates authorizations in accordance with the directive for the same product in the EEA that also in the European Economic Area uh, area that are granted later. So now. 
a few words regarding particularities regarding um, SPC infringement proceedings. Um, first slide is on the scope of protection that an SPC confer uh, confers. Here with the circle, this should be the scope. Um, we have the patent, which runs for 20 years and has a larger scope of protection than the SPC, as demonstrated here with this smaller circle inside. And this runs then for a duration to be calculated from there on. And the scope of protection is not only smaller to the patent because it is limited to the product only, but also because uh, it only covers the uses of this product as a medicinal product. Another difference regarding infringement proceedings is the uncertainty regarding the SPC validity. You have seen um, the discussions going uh, on regarding Article 3 of the SPC regulation, that there's a lot of uncertainties there and um, continuous decisions coming from the CJU which haven't even been included in international uh, decisions yet. And this leads to the fact that an SPC may not, may not only be attacked by nullifying the basic patent that is underlying the SPC, but also uh, it can be attacked for the reason that it shouldn't have been granted in the first place. And this uh, leads to the following um, scenario. I have an exemplary claim here, which is probably very common, and always the second or third independent claim in the biotech patent relating to a protein, which reads antibody binding uh, to protein of claim one. So if now the product in question is a specific antibody that is binding the claim prote protein, assuming that the basic patent is valid, patent infringement is clear in this case because it is an antibody that binds the protein. However, now if it comes to SPC infringement, the answer is not as clear as the question is whether the antibody mentioned in the claim indeed relates specifically to the claim product, namely the specific antibody in this case, as is now required by Eli Lilly, and we will see how this is going to be interpreted then by the national courts on a national level. So in summarizing, this means that for the plaintiff, if an infringement action is based on an SPC, there's more risk that in the end the infringement action might not be, resu might not result in a positive, uh, to the positive. And for the defendant, in turn, this means that there's uh, way more possibilities for defending against an attack based on SPC. Thank you very much.